Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Prayer is easy. You can do it anytime and anywhere. You can talk to God in the morning when the house is quiet. You can talk to Him when you see something beautiful. You can talk to Him when you want to thank Him for things like your family. You can talk to Him in the pain and in the crises, as well as the joy and the laughter. He wants to hear from you. He loves to talk to you. Prayer is easy. In fact, nothing could be easier. So why is it so hard? It's easy to watch TV, go to the gym, talk on the phone, surf the net for hours, but to pray for minutes seems like an eternity. Prayer is easy to do, but prayer is hard to do. But pray we must. God calls us to pray. Never ever has there been a mighty work of God apart from prayer. It's not that prayer ties God up and makes him do what we want like some kind of puppet, but rather righteous prayer, the kind of prayer that begs, that pleads, that recognizes our inability, our weakness, our dependency, and his super ability to do anything. This kind of I need you desperately prayer does much. So for God to stir in my life, for God to break sin's strongholds, for God to change my heart, for God to burn a fire for his holiness before my eyes, I must pray. The new normal means a life of unceasing prayer. Good morning, how are you today? Um, welcome online, if you're joining us online, we are starting a new series today, four part series called The New Normal. And it's a series on prayer because we believe that starting a year out uh, 2018 with prayer is just a valuable thing. It's, a, it's an underpinning to our Christian life and what we're trying to do in, in, uh, in the world. So we want to make sure we understand that. We're going to be learning about that together. And some of the, we have some homework associated with it. Okay, I don't know if you're a big homework person, but we want to we make sure that we get the most out of just instead of just listening and talking about prayer a little bit once a week. So what we've decided to do is, is the three Saturdays in, uh, in, during this series, uh, which is the 17th, next Saturday, the 24th, the following Saturday, the 3rd of March, the, the, those three Saturdays, we're going to have uh, a, an all-church prayer meeting here just in, for just one hour from 9.30 to 10.30. We invite you to come. I have a few songs and then uh, either Sharon or myself will will just share briefly about prayer. Then we're going to just spend some time in prayer. And you can just, however you want to express your time in prayer is fine. You can just just stay seated and pray to yourself. You can walk around. We'll have some time where we lead it in kind of a corporate thing where we're, where we're kind of one person's praying for all of us and we're in agreement. I encourage you to come. It's one hour. It will help with that. But prayer is more than just once a week or even twice a week. We want it to be a daily experience for you. We just came out of a series on establishing habits in your life. Psychologists say that it takes at least 21 days to start a new habit. So if you're not in the habit of regular prayer, we encourage you to come along with us in this uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting we're going to begin starting tomorrow. Uh, we started it Monday so that you have a chance to think about it. What do I want to what am I, you know, what time would be a good time for me to pray? And I think that that part is clear enough, right? 21 days of prayer. The fasting is the part that sometimes people get kind of hung up on. You know, how do I fast? Well, the traditional fast in the Bible is a food fast. In other words, you would skip a meal. You might skip not, you know, and that's what some people will do. And when we do prayer and fasting, they'll skip a meal and this, okay, breakfast or lunch or or maybe dinner, or maybe they'll, they won't eat throughout the day and then just have, have an evening meal. But during that time when you don't eat, it's a time where you're kind of, uh, even though your flesh wants to eat, right? I mean, we all have that in common. We all like to eat. 
And, uh, and, and so you're saying no to your flesh and then letting your spirit to kind of, that spirit part of you to grow and surface. And it helps you to, to become uh, more attuned to spiritual things, helps your prayer life. Now, some of you, you can't do that or you won't do that. You know, just foods, don't touch my food. And, you know, there's other ways to, uh, uh, to, to fast. You can, some people pr- fast from things that uh, kind of maybe have a grip on their life. You know, they, they binge watch Netflix all the time. And so they just say, you know what, for 21 days, I'm not going to do that. No Netflix at all. Or it could be a social media. It could be, uh, uh, you know, no alcohol or no caffeine. It could look all kinds of ways. But you do something in your life that seems to maybe, uh, you know, have maybe a bigger hole than you want. And you just say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do that for these 21 days. And in its place, it's not just an exercise in torturing yourself. You say, no, in its place, I'm going to spend a little more time in God's Word and prayer. I'm going to kind of connect with the Lord in those, in those times. So that's what, that's what we're going to do together. So that's our homework. I invite everybody to be part of it starting tomorrow, uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting. If you can't join us on the Saturday mornings, of course, we'll, we'll have that uh, online. Uh, live. And then if you'd like more ideas on how to fast and some options and you've not done that before, we also have that online, vineyardchurch.com. All of that stuff is there to help support you with that. If you would take out your outline, we are going to begin our series on prayer. David says, I love this. He's talking about his own prayer life. And he says in the Psalms, he says, I'm singing at the top of my lungs. I'm so full of answered prayer. Now, can you say that about your life? Maybe some of you can, but I think, unfortunately, most of us would say that doesn't describe us, that we're so full of answered prayer that we can sing at the top of our lungs. In fact, for most of us, if we're honest, we'd say there's thousands of prayers that go up and very few answers come down. And so we start to wonder, you know, what's the whole prayer thing anyway? So, I mean, is it, is it, is it really true? I mean, is it, is it a farce? Are we just conning ourselves, telling us prayer makes a difference, but it's really not? It's just kind of our own little fantasy life going on. And, you know, and and, I mean, it's what is prayer? Well, I think I think really the the bigger question is. Is God expected to answer prayer? I mean, what does he say about that? Does God say that he's going to answer prayer? And, and what we find when we read the Bible is we discover that really God ignores some people's prayers. I mean, he just flat ignores it. He's not interested in what they have to say at all. And that could be us. And see, unfortunately, if we fall into that, that category, then that means we're really wasting our breath. There's no reason to pray. You, you're just wasting your time, your energy, your breath, all of that. So certainly we don't want to be there. If we're going to take the time to pray, if we're going through something and we really need God to answer, we want to be somebody that God doesn't ignore. And so how do we find our way out of that place? Well, the Bible actually gives us conditions. It says that there's certain things that we need to meet conditions in order to have answered prayer. And that's what we're going to talk about right out of the gates as we have this whole month of emphasis of prayer. We want to make sure that we're praying in a way that It's answerable, right? That God's interested in answering it. So let's look at that. We see five conditions for answered prayer. Number one is you must have an honest relationship to God. This one's the most important, so we're going to spend a little more time. I have some some questions, some evaluation questions that go along with it. John, though, Jesus says in John chapter 15, he says, If you remain in me, this is Jesus talking, If you remain in me and my words, circle that, my words, that's a key phrase. If And my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. So I love what Jesus says here. It's a pretty magnanimous promise, right? He says, anything you want. No conditions on that other than you got to remain in me and my words got to remain in you. And so that's his, see, every time we see a, a promise in Scripture, but there's a lot of them thousands of promises, there's always a condition. Every promise has a premise, and this is no exception. He says, sky's the limit, heaven's the limit. Anything you want, you can ask, but you need to do this. Remain in me, and my words need to remain in you. So what is he saying there? Well, he's saying that we need to listen to him. He's, his words, we need, he speaks to us 
we need to listen to him. In other words, God's not interested in listening to us until we listen to him. He has things to say. And so if we ignore him, he ignores us. It's that simple. And so he goes, listen, but if you listen to him, he goes, the sky's the limit. You can ask for anything you want. How do we listen to God? Well, he says, my words need to remain in you. How do you know that you're interested in listening to God? Well, he, by, do we read his word? Not only do we read it, do we pay attention to it? Is it something that's important to us? Because those are his words to us. The Bible certainly is very, very important. Proverbs 28, 9 says this, God has no use for the prayers of the people who won't listen to him. Wow. That's pretty rough, right? Well, I didn't say it. It's, this, is, this is the Bible. God's saying, this is how it goes down. You want God to listen to you? You need to listen to him. And so you're saying, well, Andy, you're telling me if I don't study the Bible that he won't answer my prayers. No, I'm not saying that. What I am saying, though, is, is that as you, as you interact with God's Word, the Bible, and you let it penetrate you, as you let it transform you and change you, you're be more, you'll be more connected to God and you'll have a greater authority in your prayer life. So there is a connection, but it's not... Well, if I study the Bible a half hour, I get, you know, so many prayers answered. If I study it an hour, I get, no, it's not. It's not a mathematical equation. It's about what God is doing in your life through his word. What do you allow him to do in your life? So here's some evaluation questions to see how, where you're at in this area of having an honest relationship with God. Three questions. Number one, you ask yourself, have I refused to admit things that I've done wrong in the past? Now, when we've done stuff wrong in the past and we don't bring it to God and, and, and admit it, that's called unconfessed sin. That's, that's what it's called, unconfessed sin. In other words, it's things I've done wrong. I know I've done wrong. I should have done something and I didn't or I did something and I shouldn't have. And I, and, 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 and I just swept it under the carpet. I pretended it wasn't a big issue. That's a problem. And that creates distance in a relationship. It's true in a human relationship, right? You've done something wrong. You had a great relationship with somebody. Somehow you hurt their feelings. You do something and, it's, and then you try to meet up with them again and that's there. You know, it's like the elephant in the room. You're not talking about it, but it's there. It's, it's in between you and that person. Well, this is how sin acts in our relationship with God. Unconfessed sin. And so we need to just confess it. Hey, that was wrong, God, when I was selfish, when I was stingy, when I was, you know, when I, when I lied, when I exploded in anger, when I, whatever it is, and we just kind of name it and we say, God, I need your, your forgiveness for that. Notice what the psalmist says here. He says, he wouldn't have listened if I had not confessed my sin. So he, he says, there's, no, there's a, con a connection there. Because I, of course, the reverse is true, right? Because I confess my sin, he listens to me. And so we don't try to hide it. Isaiah 59.2 says this. It says, it is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. So it's my, my wrongs. The things I've done wrong, they create this separation. And he doesn't, God doesn't hear us. And then he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. So we're all in the same boat. We've all sinned. So we got to just, we all have to do the same thing where we confess it. And the truth is not in us. However, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I love that verse. It's one of the first verses I memorized. I needed it because I, I, a lot of things I was doing wrong. Whenever I think do things wrong, I think, hey, I don't have to get swallowed up in condemnation and feel bad and guilt. No, none of that. It's simple. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and, and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So you just confess it. Say, God, I'm sorry about that. Boom. Fresh slate. Move on. Answered prayer. Number two, am I currently ignoring any of God's principles? Am I, in other words, am I holding on to something I should be letting go of or vice versa? I'm not doing something I should be doing. God lays out his principles. And we learn that, of course, through Scripture. We learn what God wants from us. If you're in church, you'll learn it as, you, as we do Bible studies on the weekends. If you're in a small group, you learn it. As you interact with other Christ followers, you'll learn stuff you didn't know. Oh, is that in the Bible? And that's how, you know, when I first came to Christ, I was doing drugs. I don't know if you know that. 
And so when I, the night I came to Christ, I said, what next? And my brother, he didn't know. He's the one who led me to Jesus. He goes, now we celebrate by snorting coke and, and, and doing weed. I thought, cool. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Just did some lines, drank a bunch of beer, smoked some pot. That went on for like a year. We weren't in a church. I didn't know to get in. I, I, wasn't, I was a total pagan. And so then somebody told us, hey, you shouldn't be doing pot like that. You shouldn't be smoking. You, you know, shouldn't be doing drugs. I remember when I first heard that, I thought, we looked at each other. I wonder if that's true. I wonder if that's in the Bible, you know. <laughs> Turns out it was, you know. <laughs> but you don't know. But you, so we learn it. But as you learn it, was I accountable for that during that time? I don't think so. But when I figured it out, when, when I started learning God's word, I'm accountable for it at that point. And so, you know, so it doesn't mean we're perfect, certainly, but it does mean that we're willing to, uh, to try to obey what God has to say. Notice here, he says, dear friends, if your hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. I love having confidence before God and receive from anything we ask. That's beautiful, okay? So here's, that's the promise. Now here's the condition. Because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So he says, hey, we need to live right. Now, it doesn't mean we have to be perfect because you're going, hey, Andy, I'm not perfect. I'm never going to be perfect. I get that. Nor am I. But he doesn't demand perfection, but he does expect obedience. That's what we need to do. It says, hey, I have an attitude of obedience. When I learn about it, when I realize, hey, drugs isn't what I'm supposed to be doing with my life, I, you know, I, I obey. I, I turn a, a different direction. The third question is, is, am I living in harmony with God's will for my life? Am I living in harmony with God's will for my life? John 5, 1 John 5 says this. It, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. I love this. Whenever they're talking about prayer, it's always, you'll see this, re, this theme come up over and over, having confidence, going to God in confidence. And we have confidence approaching God that if we ask anything, now here's the key, according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have what we have asked of Him. Now, this is a question a lot of people have. Is, is well, am I praying, you know, is this God's will, what I'm, what I'm praying for? And, uh, and certainly that's a valid question. But here's, the, I think, the bigger question is, is, am I in God's will? Not is my prayer in God's will, but am I in God's will? Because if I'm in God's will, then what I pray for is going to be in God's will, or certainly more likely. So I want to make sure I'm in God's will. God, am I doing what you want me to do? Am, do I have the right attitude? Attitude is important, right? Attitude's real important. St. Augustine said, love God and do what you please. What he meant was, is if you really love God, if, you're, if, you're, if your heart is, hey, I want to do whatever it takes to follow God, you'll find your actions line up with that. Your thoughts line up with that. You'll want to do things that, that emphasize how much you love God. And so, the question is simple, you know, do, how's my life? What's my attitude like? And, uh, and a big part of that is reading God's word, knowing what God has to say. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Number two, you must have a forgiving attitude towards others. This is on the back of your outline. Forgiving attitude. Therefore, Jesus says, I tell you, whatever you ask it for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Another great promise, right? Here it is. Anything you ask, it's going to be yours. That's the promise. Here's the condition. Condition in verse 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. Now, more than any other characteristic other than faith, forgiveness is tied to prayer, answered prayer. We need to be people who forgive. Not because they deserve it, but because we need it. For unforgiveness... It becomes, after a while, it becomes this resentment turns into like bitterness. And bitterness is, will, will, can seep into our whole body, into our whole soul, into our mind. It's like a poison. It gets in there and it starts corrupting us. And, and it's not because they deserve it, but we forgive because we need to be released from, from all of that stuff that goes on in our life. It blocks our prayer life. Blocks our connection with God. In Matthew 5, Jesus says that if you're at 
you know, you're at church or, you know, you're, you're there before God and before the altar and you have a gift that you want to give, you know, like an offering. He says, and you remember at that moment before you give that, that you have a problem with somebody, with a brother or a sister. And you have, there's, so, there's uh, a breakdown in a relationship. He says, you need to leave your gift at the altar. Don't give it to God. Go get that right and then come back. Now you're in a place where you can come, you can pray, you can give your offering to God. He says that th there's a connection. It's connected. It's not like, oh yeah, I can be great with God and I can treat people however I want. No, it's not like that. There, we, we demonstrate our relationship with God Th and through, through, through how we treat people. So this is very important. And so we need, to be, have pl we need to be people that are seeking harmony. You know, the Bible says that if you're a pastor or really a leader, that you need to have harmony in your home. That how we treat our spouse is a big deal. That if you, if you have uh, disharmony, if you have all kinds of, uh, of, of stuff going on in your home, that God says, he won't answer your prayer. So we need to make sure that's right. Sometimes I'll need to go to God for something. I'll realize, you know, I'm not, I, you know, I, I have something going on between Sharon and I, you know, it's, I, I, I need to go get, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop. I don't pray. It's, God, it's not going anywhere. And I just, and I go and I get it right with Sharon. And then I pray. So if you come up and receive prayer from me, you should say, hey, how are you and Sharon doing? Because <laughs> you're not doing well. I'm not, this is a, a waste of everybody's time. <laughs> That's really true, but we, it's important. Harmony with people, getting along with them. God says that's important to him. That's high on his chart. Hebrews 12 talks about allowing this bitterness to get in and what it does. He says, watch out that no bitterness takes root among you, for as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. So it's a big motivation. If you want your prayers answered, realizing I need to make sure I get it right. Because first thing, my prayers won't answer it. Also, it's just going to, it'll disrupt my whole spiritual life. Number three, you must be willing to share the results. Now, this is the principle of sowing and reaping. The principle of stewardship, of generosity. In other words, that God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing to other people. And that's, and so he, that's the process. So as he, as we receive, he wants us to have open hands to others. Proverbs 21, 13 says, if a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. And so he says that if you know people in your sphere of influence, your life that have legitimate needs and you ignore them, he goes, that's a problem. That's a problem because God wants us to care about our fellow people that are going through difficult times. You go, yeah, well, they made their bed, they can sleep in it. Well, God could say that about us too. And so we need to be very careful about how we approach this. We need to say, I care about when other people are in need. Notice 1 John 3 says, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. We're ta He's talking about prayer there. He says, we, and there's confidence. And I love that. You know, we have confidence before God and we can ask anything, anything we ask. He says, because... We obey his commands and do what pleases him. Now, what pleases him? We'll notice the next verse. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. So what does he want us to do? Well, if you look at the context, come right up a couple verses before, you see what he's talking about. Here's a portion of it. Verse 17, he says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him. And so this is so vital that if we want God to bless us, he, he wants to bless us, but we need to be able to share that blessing with other people that are in need. We got to be able to look around and just, and have compassionate hearts. And so what if it's their fault? You just, you just remind yourself, hey, there's, we're all part of the same frail humanity. We make mistakes and that happens. And we still want to reach out and be kind to other people. And so when you're praying, you got to be willing to have open hands. I wouldn't think one moment for God to bless my business if I wasn't willing to turn around and, 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 and be generous in some way to, to tithe and, and to support God's work. Why would I expect God to, to bless my business? I can work and try to do it myself. I might do fine. 
but why would I want God's blessing on that if I'm not willing to be part of that? Same thing with health. You go, hey, I pray for good health. Well, what are you going to do with that good health? Are you just going to use it all on yourself? Are you going to use your, some of the energy that comes from good health to, to care for other people and help other people? You see, God wants to bless us, but he wants, and he wants to give us so much that we, keep, that it's, we have overflow. But we, he doesn't want to just bless our selfishness. Oh, gosh, you're such a good hoarder. Let me give you more. That's not how it works. You know, he wants us, as we get more than we need, to be generous. That's an attitude, and that doesn't necessarily just happen. There's plenty of people that have lots, and they're not generous. So God gives us more material, more material things than we need so that, this is the condition for the answered prayer, we can, we can be we can, people that are less fortunate us, than us, we can bless them. James 4, 3 says, you do not have because you do not ask God. So that obviously is a problem. You got to ask, but there's more to it than that. Notice another reason. He says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures, on your own pleasures. And so motive is important. See, Andy, I can never ask for anything for myself. Yeah, you can. Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. He's talking about that's for me. I'm hungry. I need something for me. So we can ask for our own needs, but we need to always be aware that as God blesses us, he wants us to be able to give to others. Motive is important. You say, well, Andy, can I ask for the right thing with the wrong motive? Yes, you can. And so motive is, is God, I want to be, I want to be a, uh, a, a conduit of your blessing. I want to channel your blessing. As you, I'm just going to, you know, certainly I'm going to be blessed out of it, but I want to be this, this, this avenue of blessing to other people around me, not just for myself. So we have have an honest relationship with God. Making sure you have a, cl- a clean slate. You're not, you're not holding on to unforgiveness. This idea of that as God gives to you, you share those rewards with others. Number four, you must believe that God will answer. James 1 says, But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. There's that aspect of prayer. Hey, I, you know, we're going to God. No, he says, why? Because he's a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. And so there's this fourth condition that we need to have faith. This is, as I said, other than forgiveness, this is the number one thing connected with answered prayer. It's having prayer that has faith in it. We go to God and we go, God, I believe you're going to do this. Now, if you say, well, I believe God can do that, is that faith? No. That's just fact. God can do it. There's no doubt about it. He can do it. So that's, a, that's, I guess, a starting place. But what if you say, well, I believe that God might do it. Is that faith? No, that's hope. And there's nothing, hey, I'm glad you're moving along. You know, that's better than he can do it. But it's different than I believe God will do it. See, this is that confidence. I told you about that theme you see over and over, going to God with boldness, with confidence, assured God's going to do this. Jesus says it this way. He says, according to your faith, it will be done unto you there in Mark 9. And then Hebrews says, actually, it's impossible to please God without faith. This is the core criteria of answered prayer. You go to God believing he is going to answer your prayer. You know, I think some people, they just don't really believe it. They, if, uh, in fact, if God answered their prayer, they would they'd probably just have a heart attack. <laughs> I mean, they would die, literally. He probably would like to answer their prayer, but he's thinking, you'll die. <laughs> I can't. I wish I could, but I don't want you to die today. <laughs> I mean, some people, they're just shocked. Like, oh my, God. you know, as opposed to walking day in, day out, just God is going to answer my prayer. Now, here's the good news that those conditions we've been looking at, if you do those, you can have confidence. You really can go to God with confidence, with faith, knowing God is going to answer your prayer. If he doesn't, that's his issue. 
Because the fact is, it's really not even a miracle. Would you consider it a miracle if you took a tomato seed and you planted it and a few months later it grew up and started producing tomatoes? No, you'd say, no, I just, I, I just cooperated with the laws of physics. Well, when you do these conditions that we're talking about in prayer and then God answers, you're cooperating with God's laws of physics, God's kingdom laws. This is how God answers prayer. So you can go with confidence. You can go, God, I know you will answer this prayer. That's why this is so important that we start this series out knowing, hey, let's have confidence as we go through this that God is going to answer our prayer because he will, absolutely. And so we need to line ourselves up with that. Number five, this is the last thing. Another condition, you pray in Jesus' name. You pray in Jesus' name. Now, Jesus said this. He said there in John 14, he said, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. Always these amazing prayer, right? Anything you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything, he repeats it, in my name and I will do it. But he says it should be in his name. He says that a couple chapters later, Jesus says, until now you have asked for nothing in my name. So that wasn't the protocol before. He goes, this is, this is what we do now. Ask and you will receive and your joy may be complete. <clears throat> so what is so special about Jesus' name? Why do we pray? You've probably heard it if you've been around church long enough or people praying over Thanksgiving meals or whatever. You've heard that in Jesus' name. What does that mean? Why do we even do that? Well, I'm not sure everybody really knows. I mean, I think some people are kind of unclear about that. Some people think, oh, that's how you sign off. Everybody's closing their eyes. Nobody knows when it's really done, right? So that's kind of the sign off, like on a CB radio, you know, 10-4, good buddy. You know, or Walter Cronkite, you know, and that's the way it is. Amen. And everybody goes, oh, that's the cue. I now can open my eyes. It's done. Let's eat. But it is not that. It is not just a closing of the prayer. I think some people think it's like, you know, like a mystical code, you know, like a secret handshake or a secret password, you know, that you need to get access. So you say your prayer and then you kind of end and, you know, with God and you kind of wink, wink in Jesus' name. And that gets you in, you know, woo, just kind of the pixie dust over the prayer. Woo, now look at that. It's got to, ha- something's got to work now, right? That's not what it's, that's not what it means. That's not what Jesus is talking about when he's saying in Jesus' name. What he's talking about is we're in relationship with him. And so when we pray in Jesus' name, it's a reminder to ourselves why we have authority, why we have confidence in prayer. It's not because of ourselves. God owes me nothing. He owes you nothing. We owe him everything, but he owes us nothing. Why would I even have the audacity to go to God with anything and think he would answer my prayer? It's because of who Jesus is in my relationship with him. I heard a story about a pastor who went to a carnival for his son's birthday and he, his son had invited a number of friends. He had 14 kids all. And they went to this carnival. And he's passing out. He went and bought tickets. And he's passing out the tickets. And he notices another kid that wasn't invited to the party. And he goes, son, what are you, uh, are you part of the party? I mean, and, and the kid goes, no, I was just here on my own. And, but I, I, I want a ticket. He goes, well, why should I give you a ticket? You're not part of the party. And he kid points over to the pastor's son. And he goes, I know him. And he told me you'd give me a ticket. He got him a ticket. And that's kind of how we are with God. We, we don't really have a right, but when we say in Jesus' name, we're pointing to Jesus and we go, I know him. And he told me I could have a ticket. He told me I could have an answer prayer. He told me that, and on his credit, because of who Jesus is, I can go to God with confidence that God will answer my prayer. And this is what it means. So do you need to end in every prayer within Jesus' name? No, I think it's a good idea because it reminds us. You could actually, though, start out your prayers in Jesus' name and then start to pray. You're reminding yourself. You do not need to say it, though. Here's the thing. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, saying that phrase means nothing. It won't help you at all. And if you have a relationship with Jesus, you don't need to say the phrase. We say it 
because it reminds us this is why I can have confidence before God. So these are the conditions. Do I have a relationship with Jesus? Do I have a relationship with God through Jesus? Am I holding on to unforgiveness? Am I allowing bitterness to get the best of me? Am I willing to share the rewards? Will I be a conduit of blessing to other people as God blesses me? What is my motive when I pray? That is important. What is my motive? Do I have faith? Am I praying with confidence? And do I remember why I can pray at all? Because of Jesus. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what Jesus provided for us. We can come confidently before you. So, Lord, I pray right now for those who are struggling with unforgiveness and it's impeding their prayer life. Some of you, your prayers are not being answered and it's not because you're not praying hard. It's not even because you don't believe enough. It's because you have unforgiveness. You have a problem in a relationship and you need to go get that right. You need to leave your gift at the altar and you gotta go and get that right. This is what Jesus says. And some of you, you need to do that. And it begin, just, you say, well, Andy, you want me to get up right now? No, but I, right now I want you just to, Decide in your heart, I'm going to get that right. If that person's already dead or you can't get a hold of them, then you do just release them right now. Just say, I'm going to forgive them. They don't deserve it. I'm not holding on to that. Some of you, your motives when you pray, you're not perfect, but God wants us to obey. He wants us to be in right alignment. And our motives really are about us, our own insecurities, our own fears, our own jealousies, our own things that we're, that we're always caught up in us, us, us. It's me, me, me. God says, I want to answer prayer so badly in your life. But get your eyes off of just your own life. Ask God to, and that's, and that's a bold prayer, my friend. Just say, God, let me be a conduit of blessings to others. Whew. That's, a, that's a dangerous prayer. You say that, and you really mean it. You can have a torrent of blessing coming into your life. Because God loves to bless other people through you, if you're willing. Just say, God, let me be that person. If you want answered prayer, say, God, let me be a blessing to those who are in need. You say, God, help me to have faith. Help me to step into this realm of prayer with confidence, not like a timid little dog that's been beat down. I want to come in like a roaring lion, king of the jungle. You say, God, give me faith to move mountains. And then lastly, this part of Jesus' name, having a real, a, 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 a deep relationship with him, would you say, God, help me to reconnect with you. If you're far from him, say, God, I want to come home today. This is not about joining the church. This is about your relationship with God. Would you say, God, forgive me for when I've tried to do things my own way and my own strength. I don't want to unconfess sin in my life, so today, right now, I'm confessing that, whatever it is. If you're not sure, you just can just say, God, I know I've done things wrong. But more than likely, the Holy Spirit pinpoints stuff right in our life and we can remember it. You just need to say, God, I ask for forgiveness for those times. And you just list them. I don't want to unconfess sin in my life. Do that right now. If you've never put your faith in Christ, this is what it means. It means acknowledging that Jesus came 2,000 years ago. God sent his son to die for you. You say, 
you just acknowledge it. You say, God, I accept that. I thank you that you paid the price on the cross for all my wrongdoing. You lived a perfect life, the one I couldn't live, and I get credited for that. You say, God, help me to live this life by your power, by your grace. And then would you say, Lord, and I think everybody could pray this, Lord, help me to live in those five conditions for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.